set of a bottle over the clock, so we should probably get started. Oh, this mic is a lot more live than I remember it being when I taught in this room the last time. I saw you trying to strike over. Okay. I think Paul Navarre has improved this sound system since the last time I was in here. I usually teach in the St. Andrew room, but, uh, but uh, I, I, got this, uh, I got the fellowship Paul this time around. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, the Book of Revelation. Uh, I, I have taught this class before. It's been about 12 or 13 years, though. This, uh, this building wasn't here the last time I taught it. I, this, it was the old fellowship hall. Some of, some of you probably remember that. Um, I did a team teaching event with Pastor Mark. We alternated weeks. Uh, back then. Uh, so this time I'm attempting it myself, all by myself. Wish me luck. <laughs> well, blame Pastor Mark if you get it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, it's Pastor Mark's fault for not being here. <laughs> if I get it wrong. Uh, I have a quote here from Revelation chapter 1 Blessed is one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written about my mighty plan. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Can you help with that, Chase? I think so. books mainly 
unveiling the empire, reading Revelation then and now. Uh, this is actually a fairly old book published in the mid-90s, but Revelation hasn't changed much since the mid-90s. So <laughs> it's still pretty good. Uh, it, it, these books come at Revelation from slightly different viewpoints. That's why I'm using three books. Uh, this one, there, there are a lot of different ways to interpret Revelation. Some of them are very bad, and some of them are pretty good. These books interpret Revelation in, in different good ways. This book talks about Revelation in terms of the uh, predicted fall of the Roman Empire and how the Christians of the time shouldn't put their trust in the empire. That's the reason the book is titled Unveiling Empire, re Revealing the Atrocities of the Roman Empire and how Christians shouldn't uh, put their trust in the Roman Empire because the Roman Empire is going to be destroyed and how Christians should trust God's kingdom rather than the Roman Empire. Uh, and by extension, all human empires. There is no human empire that is permanent, not like God's kingdom is permanent. Uh, that's the, 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 the thrust of this book. Uh, also, another way of interpreting uh, Revelation, according to this book, is Revelation pulls aside the veil and gives us a glimpse in the battle between good and evil that's going on all the time in the, in the world. Another book, Revelations, plural, by Elaine Pagels. Uh, she writes about uh, not only the book of Revelation, but other apocalyptic literature of the time. Uh, Dr. Pagels is a professor of religious history at Princeton. Uh, that's her claim to fame and has written uh, many other books um, about religious history, uh, including a book called Beyond Belief uh, about the uh, apocryphal Gospel of Thomas and uh, a book called The Gnostic Gospel. Uh, her uh, point of view, interesting point of view, is that Revelation, well, useful to all Christians, was primarily addressed by the author John to Christians with a Jewish background. <clears throat> Pardon me. With a Jewish background, and John's message, according to Dr. Pagels, was, yes, you are Christians now. You have accepted Jesus as the Messiah. So you're Christians, but uh, don't start acting like the pagan Romans. Uh, don't don't think that that gives you permission to act like the pagan Romans because you're going then you're going to go down like the pagan Romans and see look what's going to happen to the pagan Romans. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Pagel's unique uh, perspective on this book. Then a book uh, by uh, Barbara Rossing, Journeys Through Revelation: Apocalyptic Hope, Apocalyptic Hope for Today, and uh, as the title implies. The distinct point of view of uh, Rossing is that, uh, above all, Revelation is a book of hope. There's a lot of fearsome language and disasters and plagues uh, in describing the book of Revelation. But the ending, uh, I don't think it's a spoiler alert to say that the ending is very hopeful. The last two chapters talk about uh, evil being vanquished forever and God, the city of God, coming down from heaven and God making home here on earth with the people, with God's people here on earth. There's nothing about rapture in Revelation that people get confused about that sometime. Uh, the idea of a rapture comes from other places in the Bible, not, not Revelation. In Revelation God comes down to make home, make a home here with God's people on earth. But the title of uh, Mark Brocker's book, uh, Coming Home to Earth, is taken from that last part of Revelation. Uh, in fact, uh, Barbara Rossing recommends in, in, in her book that we start our study with the last two chapters 
to sort of inoculate ourselves against the horrors that the rest of the book uh, brings up. <clears throat> I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take the, the book in order. But I'm going to end on the last slide for this session is going to be a, a hopeful slide. So uh, we're going to start out that way, although then starting next week, I'm going to take all of the chapters in order. So where did this where did Revelation come from? This this session is going to be entirely introduction, and we'll talk I'll talk about why Revelation is so hard to understand, and give you some tips on reading it, and just some general information, and then we'll actually get into the chapters and verses. Then starting next week. So where did Revelation come from? By the way, I don't mind if you ask questions in the middle. You can interrupt me. That's okay. I'll try to remember to stop occasionally and ask for questions, but don't wait for that. If you if you need to know something, just ask. <clears throat> Revelation was written by a man named John on the island of Patmos. I'll put up a map pretty soon here, show you where the island of Patmos is. It's in the Mediterranean Sea near Asia Minor, the area we call the country of Turkey today. Patmos was a penal colony, a Roman penal colony. John was a criminal, according to the Romans. John had been exiled there. Why? He was guilty of spreading the gospel. He was a Christian. And he was exiled there during the reign of the Roman emperor Domitian. Dom Domitian. Um, during that time, Christians were persecuted. There was widespread persecution of, of Christians. Um, it was more widespread. Christian persecution was was more widespread than than during the time of Nero. Uh, Nero was probably more well known for persecuting Christians, but uh, the persecution during Nero's reign uh, was more limited to the area around the city of Rome. Uh, but during Domitian, the reign, the, the persecution was more widespread over the whole Roman Empire. During that time, John was arrested and uh, arrested for preaching Christianity and was exiled by the Romans to the island of Patmos. Now this John, uh, it's too bad they used just first names at that time because there were so many. John was such a common name at that time. This John is not the same as John the disciple and the gospel author. Also not the same John as the letter writer. You know, there are letters in the New Testament, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. That's a different John, but not this John. There are at least three Johns, of course, in, in, in the New Testament, and, and, and this is the, the, the author of Revelation is not the same. Now, according to John's writing in the book of Revelation, uh, he experienced visions on the now, I'll have to be frank with you, there's some uh, difference of opinion about whether these were actual visions that he had, or whether these, whether he's writing these visions as a literary device. You understand? Is that he's, he may have been using visions as a form of symbolism, a form of code to hide the meaning of what he writing, and I'll, I'll get to that in, in a little bit. Uh, we don't know for sure. But, according to John's writing, divine secrets, secrets were revealed to John in these visions. And he wrote these visions down. He wrote what he saw in a letter to seven churches in Asia Minor, today's country of Turkey. This letter provided warnings to those churches and also hope for the future. Remember, per Christians were under persecution in the Roman Empire at this time. So this letter offered words of hope to these churches. <coughs> and that letter is what we call the Book of Revelation. Okay, here's a map. see at this, just to the 
the left of center and on this map, there's the island of Patmos in that little circle. It's in the Mediterranean Sea. The land mass to the upper right is, is the southwestern area of Asia Minor, today's country of Turkey. The red dots are the seven churches that John was writing to along the coast, Smyrna and Ephesus. You've heard of Ephesus before, the book of Ephesians. Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. Then inland, the five churches of Pergamum, Thyatira, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So that sort of gives you the lay of the land. Is revelation so difficult to understand? Understanding or misunderstanding? The, the, the widespread misunderstanding about how uh, revelation should be interpreted. First, revelation is often misunderstood as a prediction, as what God is going to do to us in the future. The book is apocalyptic literature, not prophecy. Many books in the Bible are prophecy. Revelation is not. It is a, a form of literature called apocalyptic literature. There is other apocalyptic literature in the Bible, and I will get to that. We will talk about what that means. It's, it's helpful to understand the difference. The language is confusing because it is symbolic. Why did John write in symbolic language rather than plain language? It's because he had to hide the book's meaning. Remember, Christianity was under attack, and he was already in exile. Enemies, in other words, the Romans, would have destroyed, they would have confiscated this writing and destroyed it, if the meaning were clear, because he's writing against the Romans. So he had to write in a form that his friends, his fellow Christians would understand, and the Romans would not. They would read it and think of it as the ravings of a lunatic and dismiss it. But his fellow Christians would say, ah, I understand what it means. You see? Another reason it's so hard to understand is the book is written in a language of visions. It's dreamlike. It's like somebody wrote down their dreams. It's not linear, like dreams jump from here to there, from past to the future to present. It's not necessarily chronological. It's hard to follow because time doesn't mean very much. The story is told in cycles, using different symbols each time. So, if you haven't been able to understand the book of Revelation, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. Okay, let's start getting into a little bit more detail. I mentioned prophetic or apocalyptic. Let's, let's talk about what that means <clears throat> because it's important to understand the difference. The prophetic appeal, let's talk about prophecy first. What is prophecy? Well, let me give you a, 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 a common example here. So, a parent wants, uh, wants uh, their child to, do, to finish their homework. Here's the prophetic appeal for finishing homework. If you don't have your homework done by dinner time, there will be no TV for you tonight. But if you have your homework done before dinner, we'll have ice cream for dessert. That's the prophetic appeal. <coughs> Present behavior determines future events. Think about the Old Testament prophets. If you continue to disobey the Lord, the Lord will allow foreign nations to come and wipe you out and take over this land. But if you repent and return to the Lord and behave the way the Lord wants you to behave, 
the Lord will reward you and you will live long in the land. You, you, you've read that over and over in the Old Testament prophets, right? The way you behave now will control what happens to you. Your fate is in your hands depending on how you behave. That's it. Now, some prophets were more generous than others. The prophet Amos, for example, was not very optimistic. <laughs> you know, he's, he, he said, if you, if you start behaving, the Lord may have mercy on you. <laughs> Other prophets were more optimistic about uh, a change in behavior producing a good result. But uh, the book of Deuteronomy is a whole section in there. Uh, it's all about a listing of blessings and curses depending on behavior. But that's the prophetic appeal. Present behavior determines future events. <clears throat> it's all about justice in the present world. It's completely different than apocalyptic, so I'll get to that again. And I said the Old Testament prophets are full of these messages. Now, no, prophecy is not the same as prediction. Uh, prediction is something like, you will meet a tall, dark, handsome stranger. <laughs> no, notice there's no if-then in there at all. That's a prediction. Prophecy is more like if-then. Prophet, prophetic or apocalyptic? Now, apocalyptic appeal. Here's what a, an apocalyptic appeal sounds like. If you don't do your homework and your teacher gives a test tomorrow, what will you do then? A test will be coming sooner or later, so you'd better keep up with your homework. That's an apocalyptic appeal. There's nothing the student can do to keep a test from coming, if not tomorrow, sometime. can't control what's coming, so be prepared. That's the apocalyptic appeal. Nothing prophetic about it. This is apocalyptic. Revelation is apocalyptic, not prophetic. And you need to understand the difference if you're going to understand Revelation. The day of the Lord is coming. We might not know when. All we can do is be prepared. Other books of the Bible have apocalyptic content. They're not completely apocalyptic like Revelation, but for example, Daniel. Daniel can be divided into two parts. It's 12 chapters. First, ch first six chapters are folk tales. Daniel in the wine's den, the young men in the fiery furnace. You know, you know you've all heard these tales. Uh, the first six chapters are folk tales. But the second six chapters, starting with chapter seven, uh, they're apocalyptic. And uh, I'll bring up some of that uh, in a little bit. Some parts of Ezekiel use apocalyptic imagery. Literary context of apocalyptic literature. Uh, Revelation and, and, and other uh, There are other apocalyptic. Apo there's other apocalyptic literature too that's not in the Bible. This is very common uh, during that time. Um, there's, a, there's a book that is not included in the Bible called Second Essence, in which, uh, uh, in which God, through an angel, reveals divine secrets uh, to the prophet Ezra. Uh, that's another example of an apocalyptic book, but it's not in our Bible. Some common characteristics of, ap of apocalyptic literature are <coughs> Design, uh, divine secrets are revealed. Apocalyptic comes from the Greek word apocalypsis, meaning an unveiling or a revealing. That's where the word revelation comes from. The Greek prefix apo um, means from or away. Uh, so it's a taking a veil or covering off of something to, to reveal what's underneath. A focus on the end times of the, um, according to most apocalyptic literature, the present world is not worth much. It's a focus on the end times. The present world is, is lost. The author often uses a pseudonym, and I'll have to point out that Revelation is an exception. 
There's no evidence that John is a fake name. Uh, it's probably his real name. So you have to ask the question, well, why, why didn't he use a fake name like, like other, other authors? A Daniel, for example, that, he, that the, the author of Daniel, whoever it was, borrowed a name from an obscure Old Testament character. Um, the reason is because uh, these uh, books were often written under times of persecution and you could put your life in danger if you use your real name. Uh, so, so why didn't John use a pseudonym? Well, it was probably because he was already in exile. He'd already been arrested and convicted. He was already in exile. Uh, so he used his own name. Uh, he used symbolic language in confusing writing because what he wanted to protect was not his own skin, but the book itself. He wanted to keep it from being confiscated and destroyed. Another common characteristic is written in symbolic language, depictions of strange beasts and monsters, again, to hide the true meaning. Uh, events are shifted in time. It's true of both uh, Revelation and Daniel. Uh, Revelation talks about Babylon. Now, the Romans would look at that and think, well, that's ancient Jewish history, right? You know, the, the Babylonian exile happened six centuries before Revelation was written, but the worst enemies of the Jews prior to the Romans were the Babylonians. They took the Jews into exile in Babylon. So when, uh, when John writes about Babylon, he means Rome, and the Jewish Christians would know that, but the Romans, not necessarily. So that's, that, that's part of the uh, hidden language is talking about Babylon, but he means Rome. Now, Daniel, whoever the author really was, did the same thing, talking about Daniel in Babylon. But what the author of Daniel meant was that the persecutions at the time of a, of a king called Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes. And if we have time, we can see. And again, the narrative is, is dreamlike, uh, not linear in most apocalyptic literature. Here's a, a chart that is taken from a, a course of, uh, from a company called Crossways International. And this it illustrates the spiral nature of the Revelation narrative. If you start at the bottom and think of this as a spiral going up, events are portrayed using symbols like seven seals, and that's one cycle. Then there's another cycle, same events with different symbols, seven trumpets, then seven signs, then seven bowls, then seven sights, and we peak in the last two chapters with a new heaven and a new earth and the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven and God making a home with God's people. And we'll go through all of this in detail, but you can see how this would be hard to understand if you try to read it straight through. Historical context. Apocalyptic thought often appeared during times of fear, persecution or fear of what was going to happen personally or to the human race or to your country or your ethnicity or whatever. Here are some examples. I mentioned Ezekiel that used apocalyptic language. Ezekiel was written during the Babylonian exile. The Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem uh, and it started out with the Babylonians taking away the most important citizens of Jerusalem. They took them away to, to, uh, to Babylon. Uh, Ezekiel, was, book of Ezekiel wrote his work during this time. And um, the exile changed uh, what's called the Zion theology that 
God was a resident of the temple in Jerusalem. Well, when the Babylonians destroyed the temple, imagine what that did to that theology. Was there, was God even present anymore? Was God present with the Jews in exile in Babylon? Or was the Babylonian gods, were they, were they in control now? Now that the now that the temple, the home of the Jewish God, it was destroyed, right? So they had to radically rethink their theology. And in fact, if their theology started to focus much more on the book, on scripture, rather than God in the temple during the Babylonian exile, and much of the what we call the Old Testament, or at least the first part of it was written during the Babylonian exile because the book became of prime importance during that time. So their, 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 their very theology start to started to change during that time and, and, and the apocalyptic thinking in Ezekiel came out of that time of turmoil. Daniel, the reign of Antiochus the fourth epiphany, epiphanies. Uh, this was a, 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 another uh, time reign of terror. Uh, many, many Jews were slaughtered during this time. Uh, th this came out of a of a battle in. Um, let's see how do I make a long, very long story short here. Uh, the um, after the, after the Babylonian exile, the Babylonian exile ended when King Cyrus of Persia defeated the Babylonians. And Cyrus had issued an edict in 538 that uh, allowed the Jews the freedom to leave and return to their homeland and rebuild. Uh, uh, the Jewish uh, nation entered uh, the, what's called the Persian period at that time. Uh, which was, a, a, the Persians were dictators, but it was a, a relatively b benign dictatorship. They were allowed to practice their own religion, rebuild the temple, and so forth. Um, the Persian period ended with the conquering of the region by Alexander the Great. And the, uh, that started what's called the Hellenistic period, and um, that was in uh, 333 BCE. The, um, Alexander the Great didn't live long, and he was a fighter, not a lover, because he didn't leave any heirs, heirs and uh, he left no instructions for succession. So his generals started fighting over Alexander's territory. The two generals that were fighting over the area of Palestine, where the Jews lived, were uh, Ptolemy, based in Egypt, and Seleucus, based in Syria. The land changed back and forth uh, between the, the descendants of Ptolemy and Seleucus until the descendants of Seleucus, known as the Seleucids, uh, 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 gained control. And one of the, these Seleucids was Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who was just flat out insane. Uh, Epiphanes means manifestation in Greek. He was convinced that he was the earthly incarnation of the Greek god Zeus, and he made it his mission to stamp out Judaism. He made the practice of Judaism illegal under penalty of death. Many Jews were slaughtered at a time of intense terror. The only worst time in history to be a Jew would have been during the Holocaust in the 20th century. A, a very terrible time. Again, times of terror like this often result in apocalyptic literature, and the second half of the book of Daniel is, is that type of literature. It was written during this time. <clears throat> One of the uh, quotes from Daniel 7, the, uh, Daniel 7 has visions of strange monsters, uh, strange beasts, symbolizing the uh, kings of the Seleucid reign. But then Daniel says, 
Then I saw one like a son, son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. Son of man means human being, but this is a very special human being. Of course, a human being coming from God. You'll remember in the Gospels, Jesus adopts the phrase son of man to mean himself. Jesus is the special human being coming from God. Now, another example I have to use, of course, is Revelation, because that's what we're supposed to be talking about here. Uh, Revelation was written during the reign of uh, Emperor Domitian in uh, uh, 81 through 96 uh, during the Common Era. Uh, another time of, per this time, persecution of Christians, not Jews. Uh, widespread persecution of Christians. Uh, there was some pers persecution of Christians by Nero earlier, but it was more limited to the area around the city of Rome itself. Now, you may have a laugh over this. According to the book Unveiling Empire, the time of the rise of reports of flying saucers in the 1950s and 60s, the authors of that book claim that maybe a possible reason is because of the threat of nuclear annihilation with the growing tensions of the Cold War and the growing stockpile of nuclear weapons between the United States and the Soviet Union. Many people were, were very afraid during this period of time in the 50s and early 60s. People were building fallout shelters in their basements and there was a rise in sightings of what we call UFOs today, but back in those times they were called flying saucers. And many of the reported visitations of aliens from space included reports of, uh, of a calls for peace on Earth. And uh, this may have been a subconscious or unconscious reaction to very scary news that was happening uh, to people here on Earth, at least according to the authors of the book uh, Unveiling Empire. <coughs> and I'm going to end up this class um, on Unveiling Hope. Now, did, did anybody have any? questions so far in this. Well, I will, uh, after I get done here, well, I'll open it up to any questions in general, of course. This is my last slide. I'll just go through this slide and then we can talk about all of this. One comment is, Revelation is rich in songs of praise to God and Jesus. There, I, Revelation may be the richest source of words for hymns in our hymnal. There's a class later in this year, I think it's during the Lent, Lenten season, about hymns as poetry. <clears throat> Very often we sing hymns and, and don't think, think more about the music than the words, but uh, words of our hymns are really poems. So I, I believe it's during the Lenten season that we're giving a class on the poetry of hymns. But Revelation is a rich source of words for our hymns. Uh, maybe the most famous is the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Most of the words of the Battle Hymn of the Republic are taken from Revelation. But also uh, the hymn Holy, Holy, Holy is taken right up. Casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea, right from Revelation. Revelation 4, verses 8 through 11. Some words from Handel's Halloween Chorus are from Revelation. And many others. I think, I think I read in one of these books that there are 15 hymns whose words are come, come right out of Revelation. At least some of their words come out of Revelation. And as I mentioned, God will come to live with us on earth. Revelation 21, see the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. 
Nothing about a rapture in Revelation. That comes from elsewhere. And the message of Revelation is one of hope. If you attended uh, John Cora's funeral uh, yesterday, you heard a reading from Revelation about hope. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Again, from Revelation 21. Chapters 21 and the very short chapter 22 is all about hope. So, um, that's my uh, material for today. And next week we'll start going through the letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Lynn. So where does the rapture come from? Where does the rapture come from? I can think of two places. There's a section in Matthew. I should have looked those things up so I can give you chapter and verse. <laughs> It doesn't come from here. There's a section in Matthew, I can't quote chapter and verse, but it's to the effect that uh, two are working in the fields, uh, one is taken and one is left. You might remember words to that effect. There is also a section, there's also a writing by, uh, um, in either, it's either 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians about the author it might be 2 Corinthians because I'm not sure it was really written by Paul. It's one of the books that claimed to be written. 2 Corinthians is claimed to be written by Paul, but I don't think it really was. But it's uh, the author is, is trying to reassure people that, that, that are asking, well, what about, what about people who are already dead? What's, what's going to happen to them when Jesus comes again? And the author is assuring that the dead will be raised and then those of us who are still alive will be taken up to meet Christ in the clouds. And so that sounds a little bit like a rapture, right? And those, those of us who are alive will be taken up to meet Christ in the, in the clouds. Actually, it's not. I mean, if you, if you look at the Greek for that description, it is, it is more like the description of what happens when a, a king Come, approaches a city for to come to a city and people in the city are looking out from the city walls and watching for the king's procession to come to a city and when they see the king's procession starting to approach they will run out of the city walls to meet the king's procession to escort it into the city so what what the words in, in Corinthians are talking about is not a rapture, but a welcoming of our king to earth. Now, I can't ex easily explain the way the passage in Matthew about one is taken and one is left. I, I don't know. I can't, I can't explain the way that one is easily. But, but yeah, that's where those, those passages are where that idea of a rapture comes. Anything else? Okay, well, I hope to see you next week. We'll get into those letter letters, the seven letters, the, the, uh, the, uh, the seven letters, the, each church is, uh, uh, there's a remark, of, there are remarks to each church. Well, here's where you're doing good. Here's where you flunk. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and here's where you can do better. So uh, thanks for coming. We'll see you next week.